the next one ready to go. And when we start the next lesson, we're going to be starting a lesson each on each one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. You also find on your seats as you sit down, there'll be one of these little things. Uh, don't worry about them until the morning service. And the morning service will take care of that. That has to do with the Christmas fellowship. Uh, we're going to be doing one of the voting systems of numbers one to five and uh, weight it and all that type of stuff and let you pick what we're going to eat that night. Okay? Um, so we'll go over that in a little bit. Now, as we were <clears throat> going, we were talking about the ruler of the world and we talked about uh, problems in the first century. Um, we talked about politically, religiously, socially. And we talked about how to the affluent Romans, Christians were seen as a threat that undermined the cultural structure because they taught all people were equal, which would initiate concerns of a slave revolt. Is that, you know, that's, why they, that's why they were always leery of them in the Roman Empire. And really to this day, um, what does Christianity teach? What does the Bible teach? That all men are equal at the foot of the cross, correct? Jesus doesn't see bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, um, but all either in Christ or not in Christ. All right, now, so we should be on, I believe, page 13. Well, your notes may not be page 13. My notes are page 13. Page 3. All right. My notes have a continuous number. I just realized that. All right, so if you're on page 3, um, we'll continue on. And right now we're going to go through a little bit of the history behind, uh, in the Roman Empire, behind John and all that went on with John as he wrote this book. Now it says, uh, therefore Christianity was soon recognized as an illegal religion. Tertullian, a Christian apologetist, apologist later summarized how these items impacted Rome and Roman thought. And this is what he wrote. All right. Um, this is what this historian wrote. He said, if the Tiber reaches the walls, so if the Tiber River reaches the walls and is about to overflow, if the Nile does not rise to the fields, so it doesn't get water, if the sky doesn't move where the earth does, if there is famine, if there is plague, the cry at once is Christians to the lions. Wouldn't that be a wonderful time to be a Christian? Whatever goes wrong, the solution is feed some Christians to the lions. Um, you know, sometimes we think we have it a little bit difficult. I think they had it more difficult, right? Now, uh, the first Christian persecution began after July 19th, A.D. 64. When Nero blamed the Christians for burning Rome. Now, if you've studied history, who burned Rome? Was it the Christians or was it Nero? It was Nero. Like, Nero did it, um, but he blamed on the Christians. Okay? Uh, this resulted in many Christians being executed. As a result of this persecution, uh, soon spread all around the Roman Empire. Now, 30 years later, Domitian instigated an official persecution of the Christians, which extended to the province of Asia, which would be Asia Minor, uh, which would be modern day. Does anyone know what modern day Asia Minor is? Turkey, right? Modern day Turkey, uh, where the seven churches mentioned in Revelation reside. Most of those reside in that, that region. Uh, Domitian and his family had a long history of anti-Semitic, anti-Christian sentiments. Now, we're just going to tell you the history that he came from. Uh, Domitian's father, uh, Vespasian, and his brother, Titus, despised the Christians and the Jews. All right, his father, Vespasian, led the Roman Empire against Judah in AD 66. All right? before, finishing, before he finished taking Jerusalem, he was made emperor, which left his son Titus 
Domitian's brother to finish the job of dismembering Israel in AD 70. You know how historically Titus is given the credit for capturing Jerusalem and destroying the temple. Uh, that was started by his father. And the only reason his father didn't finish the job was his father was made the emperor. And if you're made the emperor, you're not going to probably be on the front lines, are you? You're probably going to go and he, you know, lovingly stuck his son on, on the front lines. And Titus finished the job. Now, uh, Vespasian built the great Roman Colosseum. And so you go to Rome today, you see the Roman Colosseum. This guy built it. And his son Domitian was the first emperor to bring Christians to the Colosseum to face the lions. So you understand that this guy who did the first big persecution of the Christians had a family history of not liking Christians. Right, Domitian's brother Titus tore down the walls of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So Titus was the one who did that and finished dad's work. Um, there. All right. Now, Domitian, moving on to Domitian. Domitian saw himself as a new Augustus, an enlightened despot destined to guide the Roman Empire into a new area, era to brilliance. Like he just thought he was it. During his 15 year reign, among the longest of any Roman emperor, was the he was the first to demand that he is addressed as Dominus A. et Deus, or Master and God. So he was the first one to demand you call him Master and God. And he was ruthless and was hated by the Roman Senate. He was finally assassinated in AD 96. You make the Roman Senate too mad at you, you're probably not going to live long, okay? If you study our history. And it was Domitian who sentenced the Apostle John at 90 years of age to be exiled on Patmos. Can you imagine exiling a 90-year-old man to Patmos? And that was after you already tried to boil him in oil and couldn't kill him that way? Now, uh, Revelation 1 verse 9. You look at that, it speaks of this. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, so note three things regarding suffering this passage. Number one, he says he was a fellow sufferer for Christ. Companion of tribulation. He was a fellow sufferer for Christ. Second thing to note, he was a companion in the kingdom. Uh, not the pagan kingdom that we talked about, but the real kingdom to come. And he was a companion in the patience of Christ. Now, patience remain, means to remain under or to be patient to patiently endure difficulties without giving up. Okay? So that word patience literally means to be able to endure difficulties without quitting, without giving up. Now, he was... Do, do, would we say John was uh, very much a companion uh, in tribulation? Yes. In trials? Yes. Um, in the kingdom? Yes. And was John a companion in the patience of Christ? Uh, suffering. Yeah, he was. Okay. Now, here's some interesting things I found out about Patmos. Now, I don't know about you, but in my mind's eye, for some reason, the way being exiled to Patmos was all, uh, maybe it was just how I viewed it, but you almost viewed it like they dropped them off on a desert island and left them there. Does anyone else see it that way? Have seen it that way? Yeah? Well, I began to, to do some study and research, and I found out it's not, not, not quite that way. It's not like 
they exiled him to Patmos, and he was on a desert island all by himself. Um, <clears throat> in John's case, he was exiled as a common criminal to an island 16 kilometers off the coast of modern-day Turkey. Now, according to Rome, the Roman historian Tacitus, this type of exile involved harsh, exhausting labor under the watchful eye of a Roman guard. So if you go back and you study historians from that time, um, exiling to Patmos was being sentenced almost to a prison island, like a prison camp. You know how like we see those type of islands in Indonesia, like off of Bali, where they put people and they, they kind of hold them there? Um, and it's like a work camp. Like, it's not like, okay, back in this time, prison wasn't going to a resort. Okay? I've done prison ministry um, in, in my time when I was in, in Bible college. And, you know, I would walk through the prisons and for some reason they stuck me in maximum security. I was the preacher that went into the pod and they would open up. They would, I would go in and you'd go into a little like tunnel and you, you, they would, you'd go there, they'd open the door, you'd step inside, they'd latch the door and you'd hear click, 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 and you were locked into this little hallway. And then they would make sure this door was locked and then they would open this door and you'd hear that click, 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 and you'd open it and you'd go in, you'd step inside and you'd be inside a room, you know, like with chairs and stuff like that. And then you'd hear click, 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 click. And then you would look out this window and then that would be all the prison pods, you know, where all the cells were and, and all that type of stuff and, and the inmates walking around. And then when it was time for church, there was one door facing that way that you'd hear the click, 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 and that door would open. Well, there was nowhere for you to go. This door was locked, and that door was locked, and, and all the way out, you know? And they would come in, and, but as you were walking to get to that point, man, I saw like beautiful swimming pools, state-of-the-art gyms, you know, workout gyms, and you know, basketball, full, you know, three or four full-court basketball courts, indoors, outdoors. The indoors ones were air-conditioned. Like what? And like I walked by the cafeteria and you can see the food and you're going, that looks good. At that point I'm thinking, that looks better than the cafeteria where I go to Bible college. Can I eat here? And they told me no. Uh, I wasn't allowed in there. And you just walk through and it was just, you look in and in the, the common area they had a, a big screen TV. And someone was flipping the channels. And you began to, as they flipped the channels, it wasn't like, you know, at home with just an antenna and you only have two or three stations. No, no, no. They started flipping the channels and they had like all the cable sports channels, all the, you know, the full cable, you know, package. And you're going, Patmos wasn't that, okay? Uh, Patmos was the type that you go to and you, you know, you kind of work, right? Under the eye of, of a Roman guard. Now, Also, according to that, that, that would that take place, and John no doubt had insufficient food and clothing and had to sleep possibly on the bare ground. Um, this must have been extremely difficult, but let alone for a 90 year old man. Can you imagine? You know, if, if that's where you're saying. Now, this isn't just a 90 year old man, this is a 90 year old man who they attempted to boil in oil. Correct? So can you imagine your whole body being immersed and tried to be boiled in oil and then sent, because that didn't work, to this island and at times having to do work, at times having to do different things, right? So that's John on Patmos, right? The reason for his imprisonment, his imprisonment exile was twofold. One, um, for or because of the word of God, or and then for or because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, why would someone want to go through such a difficult situation? There's a lot of answers to that. He was a companion in the kingdom of God. Revelation 1 verse 9. Revelation 1 verse 5 tells us this. 
and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So Jesus is the prince of the kings of the earth. Why is it when it comes to stuff like this, you obey God rather than men? Because Jesus is in charge. In uh, Revelation 1, verse 4, we see Jesus is the one which was, which is, and which is to come. Which was and which is to come. Now in Revelation 1, verse 8, and verse 11, verse 17, verse 18, we also find that Jesus is the, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. All right? And Alpha and Omega is the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. So, it is wonderful to see the true ruler sitting on the throne. Jesus, who is the prince of the kings of the earth. All right? That's why we've called this study, He Reigns. When you're looking at the ruler of the world. Rule to come. Rule. No worries. He, and John was waiting for his rule to come just like you and I are, correct? Um, we're, we're, I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be nice when on earth Jesus is the one ruling? And that millennial kingdom is like the earth is how it was supposed to be. That'll be a nice time. That'll be a great time. Anyways, we'll get into that a little bit more later. All right? Um, look at verses. Uh, John, after all that, John then is overcome with joy as he gives praise to Jesus throughout this time. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. The last half of verse 5 says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests of the God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hey, you understand what John said? John just told us that, that Christ loves us. That he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests unto God. Verse 7, he then reminds us of his return. Behold, he cometh with clouds. All right. Despite the scoffers who deny the second coming, the Bible repeatedly affirms that Jesus will return. That this truth appears in more than 500 verses throughout the Bible. The idea of a returning Christ, returning Messiah, uh, appears in more than 500 verses throughout the Bible. It has been estimated that one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament refers to the second to the second coming. So for every 25 verses you have in the New Testament, one refers to the second coming. Now granted, you're going to find a lot of those probably in the book of Revelation, right? Uh, you're going to find a lot of them in certain places. You'll find a, a lot of those verses probably in, in the book of Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Um, but when you average it all up, it's about 1 in 25 verses. So if you're looking at the if you're looking at Matthew and you read the first 25 verses, it doesn't mean in those 25 verses you're going to find one. Um, but when you average it out over the course of how many verses there are on the second coming and how many verses there are in the New Testament, it averages out into that ballpark. Does that does that make sense? Because uh, when I was reading those stats, I went, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. I think wrap my head around that for a minute. All right now. Jesus repeatedly spoke of his return. He, he, he repeatedly talks about how he, he was going away and where he goes, you don't know, and you can't come with him. 
Uh, we just, we've seen that in the last couple of passages we've read in John. He warned believers to be ready for it. So you want to, I'll come again, you better you be ready for it. And the return of Jesus is a central theme of the New Testament. Okay. Third thing we see. John refers to two Old Testament passages in one verse. Look at verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, that part of that verse actually quotes two Old Testament passages in one little point there. Uh, take your Bible turn to, in the, in the, in the first verse, we look at, um, look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, uh, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So that, that idea of coming in the clouds that was there. Now look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for him, uh, mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness from him, uh, from him as one that is in bitterness of his firstborn. And so that, that concept of an every eye shall see him, uh, look at verse, it says verse 7, uh, behold, he that cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And so that, that every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, uh, is coming from that concept there in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. All right, in, this, in that passage of Zechariah, we find the nation of Israel mourning in general repentance. Um, this is referring to an event. What would be interesting is when Christ returns, can you imagine uh, the only man, really, the only man-made thing in heaven? What, does anyone know what the only, some of the only man-made things in heaven are? The pierced hands and, and uh, the scars on Christ. Right? The scars. The, you know, when Jesus' his hands were pierced and his feet were pierced when there was, and then his side was pierced. Um, and, and apparently, um, I don't know, I, I, you'd think in a glorified body you wouldn't have them, uh, but apparently Jesus still bears them. Because if you study out prophecy when he returns, and every eye shall see him, the Jews will instantly recognize that's who he pierced. And the Bible says, as a nation, they will turn. Uh, and it will be an interesting moment in time. All right, now, number four. Uh, John divides those who see the second coming into two groups. Into two groups. Uh, verse seven. Behold, he that cometh through the clouds, and every eye shall see him. Here's the first group. And they also which pierced him. Alright, 
Who pierced them? The Jews. Now I know it's for our sins, so technically speaking, all of our sins pierced him. I get that. But think about it. Those who physically pierced him, they were the Jews. And then it goes on, and look what it says. And all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. All right? So you have all kindred of the earth. So you have the Gentiles. We talked about in every eye shall see him. It's Jews and Gentiles. It's, it's a worldwide event. It is not something that's just going to happen hitting that only the Jews will see Jesus return. No. Uh, those who pierced him and uh, every kindred of the earth. So every kindred of the earth pretty much covers everyone that's not Jews. And those who pierced him pretty much covers the Jews. As that pretty much is everyone on earth, right? Pretty well. All right. So, uh, this is a reference to the unbelieving Gentile nations. Many will mourn over Christ. Uh, some related to their repentance, and others for their failure to turn to Him. All right. Now, look at Revelation chapter seven. We'll look at verse nine, ten, and verse fourteen because it speaks of this. Uh, Revelation chapter seven. Verse 9 and 10 it says, After this be, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Going down to verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, that thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, but in general, mourning at the time of Jesus' return will not be as a result of repentance. There will be some, but of despair, of terror, and of grief. They will be mourning over their doom because they rejected Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 21. <clears throat> Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their theft. So, there be a group that they're, they're not repenting. It doesn't matter if this game, they're, they're not repenting. And so we began to see a little bit about uh, the ruler of the earth. And, and I know we're taught in Scripture that the ruler um, of this earth, of the principalities and all those things, is the devil. And yes, he's the ruler of this earthly system. But you do understand that no matter what, as we've said for this study, Christ still reigns. He reigns, correct? And Jesus is the true ruler of the world. And we're seeing that um, all throughout this, this study. Now, technically speaking. <laughs> we're going to start in chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, let's look at verses 1 to 7. We'll probably just um, sort of introduce this. Um, because in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, we start getting the seven churches. Um, and, and there's a lot of theories, a lot of things out there. There's people who will teach that um, every church that you read in the book of Revelation um, represents a church age. 
and therefore they try to fit us into one of the church ages based on where we are and things of that nature. Uh, I mean, could it? Yeah, I guess you could apply it in that way, but here's how I tend to take the Bible. You ready for this one? You want a, you want a mind-blowing thing? I believe there are seven literal churches that literally existed, that Jesus came and revealed some things to John, and John wrote letters to them, and that these are actual literal churches, and these are actual literal issues within those churches that Christ had with them. Now, can we apply Christ with, now, we can say this, if we have these issues in our presence, then Christ would have issues with us too, correct? Like, if he had issues with them for having them, then he probably kind of have issues with us for having them. Uh, I'm not saying you might not be able to line them up, the different eras of the church and all that type of stuff in history. Um, but I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure out which era and all that. I'm just going to say, there's seven churches. They're literal churches that existed. Yeah, how do we know? Well, one of them is the church of Ephesus. You ever read Ephesians? It's a real church, correct? And that's the one we're going to jump into first off. So Revelation chapter 2, I'll uh, read the first seven verses. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labors, and thy patience, how thou canst, how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its out of this place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicol Nicol Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He hath, that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, now, have you ever seen someone put little or no effort into their work? They just kind of like do what they can and kind of coast. They do the bare minimum to keep from being fired, you know? If I just do just enough work, they, I don't give them a reason to fire me. But I really don't really give a reason to do anything else with me. But as long as they leave me alone and keep giving me a paycheck, you know, that type of, yeah, that's not, okay. Uh, they're, they're, they're there bodily, but absent in spirit or mind, you know. Uh, they're physically there, doing whatever the task is, but, you know, in their mind, they are so far gone. They can't wait for the clock to change so they can clock out and go home. And when it's time to go home, watch out. Boy, you're probably going to get trampled. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Don't have to give me a name, but hey, you know. And if you're looking at me, you go, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You're probably the one people are thinking about, okay, at, at work, all right? Um, now, certainly, the love they might have for their job has worn off. Let's be honest. Have you ever had a job or something that you did that was really awesome at first, but the longer you did it, the more it was like, I've got to do this again. I've got to do this again. Yeah, yeah, you've been there, right? Hey, if you're a parent, you know, babies are really exciting, but, you know, the sleepless nights were off quick, don't they? Changing nappies were up. You know what? Awesome. In my house, you know what my wife quickly trains all the little ones to this point? To this day, even told me. The other day, I'm sitting in my office, just working, studying, and you know, getting some stuff together, and in walks Tommy into the office. And I said, hey buddy, what's going on? He goes, shoo-wee, I stinky. And I said, so 
Yeah, okay. And I said, are you really? He said, uh-huh. That's why, I lean, you know, you go to lean over and you don't need to lean over. You get the picture. And I said, so what are you doing here? Mom said, Daddy. Oh, Daddy. Daddy, I think you. Okay, I get it. You say, why? In our house, when the when I'm around and, and the, the little ones are stinky, they they come to me. And you know and the first few times that it happens, like when you have your first child, that's sort of like cute and endearing. Like, oh they want me. But after like a hundred nappies, and all you get is the dirty ones and the dirty the dirties, the, 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 the thing that they want their daddy does not be so appealing, does it? Huh? Okay, four children later, it really has lost its appeal. But you know what you do? You say, okay, buddy, let's go. There's some things you just have to do, right? They're not as new, they're not as exciting um, as they once were. Um, imagine a congregation of believers in Christ becoming complacent in their worship. That which was once a vital commitment to Christ has grown cold, stagnant. And different. Doctrinally, they are still on point. They are still orthodox, if you want to use that. Evangelically, they understand the message of the gospel that needs to be spread. And they know that they must be socially responsible. But just because of their orthodoxy and their and, and but their orthodoxy and their activities are no longer out of devotion to the Lord but are simply out of habit. Have you ever caught yourself in your Christian walk that you're doing stuff not, out, not because you love God, but because it's a habit that you just do? Their spiritual fire for Christ has faded. Their commitment has grown lax, and their zeal for the Lord has just kind of fizzled out. Such was the church in Ephesus. They allowed their fire for Christ to grow cold. Here, Jesus confronts them in no uncertain terms. No uncertain terms. And basically what he's telling them is regain what you lost or I'll remove you. I don't know about you, but that's a scary ultimatum coming from God. Regain what you've lost or I'll remove you because you've ceased from existing for the purpose I put you there. And I can tell you, I've seen church after church after church removed when this happens. After church, after church. <clears throat> there is a church I can think of. Um, Emmanuel Baptist Church, Pontiac, Michigan. You might have heard of it. The pastor there was Dr. Tom Malone. I had, it was one of the churches in America that had been Western Baptist College. And really, the graduates that came out of there shook the world with church planting. Uh, where I grew up, every, every, almost every major church that's impacted the Northeast uh, in the New England states in the U.S. was started by a graduate from that school. Uh, all the churches that I grew up around, they were all started by graduates from that school. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saved and churches started from there. If you were to go there today, it's an abandoned building that's been destroyed and built over. It, the church does not exist. Did they did they go crazy doctrinally? No, they didn't. They were sound right to the end. But somewhere along the way, they lost that, that love, they lost that fire, they lost that zeal. And just quickly went, and they're gone. Sad thing because you know the, the history and the legacy and the impact they made, and it doesn't exist anymore. And this is what Jesus is talking about. So, <clears throat> terms found in our text. Let's just clarify some terms. Look at Revelation chapter one and verse twenty. So sometimes when Jesus, when the, when the Bible, especially the Book of Revelation, uses terms and pictures. You kind of let the Bible interpret the Bible. Is that, have you ever, ever heard that principle? Let the Bible interpret the Bible? Okay, so let's try to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Because he's talking about angels and he's talking about candlesticks being removed. And, so let's go back to verse 20. 
The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, all right, let's, let's think about this. What does the word angel mean? What's an angel? A messenger, okay? So when the Bible refers to angels of the churches, it doesn't necessarily have to refer to a, you know, what you think of with wings and, but an angel's a messenger, right? Yes? Okay. Um, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, so he says to the church, he says, I'll remove your candlestick. What's he referring to? Their church. Correct? All right, so let's, let's define some terms here. Um, Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, John gives us the key to interpreting this passage. The stars represent the angels or the pastors who considered, who considered the messengers of the local churches. All right, so... That's why I said, what does angel mean? And it means messenger. So in this instance, uh, you're seeing it's not referring to a, an actual angel, like angelic being. The, the angel is the messenger of the church. Now, please, don't call me angel. <laughs> I'm not an you know. Um, don't do that, okay? Um, but so that way we, we're understanding where we're going here. Now, the candlestick represents the local assembly of believers. That, that church the, candles, the seven candlesticks represent the churches, right? So, um, therefore, Jesus has John write to the angel or the pastor at Ephesus to tell them that he is examining their works. Ephesus used to be one of the glowing churches in Asia Minor, and Jesus was standing in their midst. Right? So, sometimes when people go to the book of Revelation, they're like, oh, this is too hard to interpret. Well... It just told you how to interpret itself before it started, didn't it? When it starts talking about the seven candlesticks and the seven angels, he, he says, now I'm going to do something, but before I do it, let me define the terms I'm about to use. So don't use any of the terms in what God defined the terms to be. Okay? Simple. Hence is another reason why I say these seven churches are seven local churches. Right? Uh, because he's talking to them directly. All right, now, um, Ephesus' historical background. Uh, we'll, we'll get started a little bit. Uh, just to understand a little bit about what he's referring to here in Ephesus. Ephesus was a glowing church in the midst of what people would call a magnificent town. It was the seat of the Roman government for all of Asia. And a Roman uh, proconsul sat there. So this was an important seat. This was the seat of the Roman government in Asia. Um, so you understand, Paul's method of church planting is a lot different than a lot of modern day methods of church planting. Do you, you see that Paul continually went to big cities or cities that influence went out to a lot of other cities? Can you see that? Like, Ephesus is the seat of the government, and it influences all this area. So therefore, if he establishes a church or churches in Ephesus, then they can launch out into all the areas of people that come in um, for supplies and things of that nature. Um, commercially, it was probably a lot like, um, like Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney. Okay, if you want to... An American significance, it was probably like New York City on the East Coast. You say, why? Because it was the seat of trade, of art, of learning, of government, of wealth, and religion for that area. Uh, so if you want to go like this, the place of arts, it would probably be like Melbourne um, or Sydney. Um, if you want to talk about wealth and, and all that type of stuff in the government, um, that's more down in the New South Wales area. But all over in, in in Brisbane is the seat of the government for our state. So kind of that, that type of a city, if you'd want to put it in the scale um, in your mind. And Ephesus ranked among the three top cities of the, on the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the three top cities were Antioch, located in Syria, 
Alexandria in Egypt, and in Asia Minor it was Ephesus. Well, two out of those three, does they not sound familiar about church plants? Antioch and Ephesus, those three major cities. All right, so uh, we'll pause there, and uh, we'll pick back up uh, with more of the background, and then jump into um, this study on the growth of the church of Ephesus. All right, so let's pray. And we'll be dismissed, and then we'll be back here for a church at 1015. Father, thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this time that you've given us together again in your word. I pray, Lord, that we can learn uh, from the church at Ephesus. And Lord, may we keep our love for you, our zeal for you um, burning. And Lord, may we follow you in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'll, let me just, I don't know, I think I've individually said it, uh, but the restrictions have folded back. So therefore, as long as you're seated, in here, you're supposed to be able to have your mask off if you, if you want to. If you'd rather keep your mask on, keep your mask on. I don't care. Um, but when we stand up and move around, we're supposed to have our mask on. Um, so that just means we're going to sing seated. Oh. Right? So that way you can... <laughs> So therefore, don't tell me, I can't sing with this mask on. Then sit down. Right? All right, let's start in a few minutes. <laughs>